think it's working. Okay, so um, hello everyone. Um, thanks for joining us again in FINE this week. It's, uh, it's really nice seeing a bunch of you. We were just having a conversation about teaching um, a number of us, which was fun to hear, listen to. Um, it, the, the live stream seems, oh, I'm getting some feedback. Give me one second. I guess it's a good idea to turn the live stream off on YouTube on your own computer while you're doing this. Um, so, so we have, um, uh, this week we're gonna be having a different kind of seminar. I'll be presenting on a working group uh, report on uh, using fine and other remote seminars and teaching. Um, just before I, I start, uh, my talk, just a, a reminder, uh, well, first to say thank you to last week's speaker was Susan Perry, she gave a wonderful talk on uh, capuchin monkeys and innovation. It was really, really fascinating um, and fun to hear. And then um, this week, or, or I'm sorry, next week, we have John Kilpatrick, I believe, is coming from Cornell University to talk about um, cooperative breeding in Florida scrub jays. Uh, for those of you who are new to find, uh, the way this is going to work is we're going to have a, you know, I'll be presenting for about 45 minutes or so. And after the presentation, we'll have an opportunity for people to engage in discussion, have about an hour of, up to an hour of questions and discussion about this topic. Uh, with us today are some of the members of the working group that um, participate in the development of these ideas I'll be presenting today. And during the discussion, if they want to jump in and provide their feedback, I'd be happy for them to do so. We'll talk about that as we get to that point of the presentation. So I'm going to uh, set up my talk here. If I apologize, I'm always struggling with the Zoom technology, despite the fact that I use it regularly. All right, there we go. Can everyone see this okay? Thank you, Marin. Okay, so um, today the, the working group is going to be um, I'm going to be talking about the, the working group activities that uh, basically happened um, over the period um, between, um, between the two fine seminars. And again, I apologize. I'm trying to get into speaker mode here. Uh, let's see. All right, it's always in front of a big crowd that I forget how to do something. Eduardo, <laughs> we should have practiced this beforehand. All we I, can see is your slide. We can't see your notes or anything. Well, I'm trying to get my face into the video. Well, go to speak, go to view top right corner. Yeah, it's a little the small box, right? And select side by side speaker. I can I, actually I can see, see you, Lauren. Oh, you can? Okay, I can't see myself. Yeah. Okay. All right, so I apologize. I, I can see you in a little square at the bottom. Oh, wonderful. Okay, thanks, Elena. <laughs> All right, so I apologize yeah. for that delay. Um, you know, I always think it's actually, it's good. I think that my students see that I, I, I struggle with technology. I'm human. Um, so today I'm going to be talking, uh, reporting to you on a fine working group where we, we worked on ideas about remote seminars and teaching animal behavior. And um, before, I, before I start and introduce the, the group and talk about sort of what we were doing, I wanna just think a little bit about sort of the philosophy behind, you know, my view on education. And so I have a bunch of images up here that of a university in the United States, this is the university where I work, the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. And I think when we use the word university, a lot of us, these images are conjured up of, you know, the buildings, um, the, you know, the United States, the athletic fields, the, 
you know, the dormitories where the students live, you might think about the library, and certainly then people might think about the faculty and the students that are there. But there's a university that I like to think about that I consider the real university. And this idea comes from the book Zen and Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persig. It's a book that I've read, I think three times in my life. I try to read it every seven to 10 years to get a new perspective on, on the world. Uh, based on my own experience at that time. And the quote is that the real university has no specific location. It owns no property, pays no salaries, and receives no material dues. The real university is a state of mind. It is that great heritage of rational thought that has been brought down to us through centuries and which does not exist any specific location. And this quote really hit home for me long ago and, and continues to this day because you know, we're living that right now. Um, you know, the fine, as I see it, is a university. It's an opportunity for us to exchange ideas and learn from each other in a time when we can't be physically together. And I literally read this quote to my students when in the fall, when I taught online for, in earnest for the first time, um, I read this quote to them because I wanted them to feel like we were having a connection, an intellectual connection, a real university, despite the fact we were learning remotely. And so what we face, I think, is a, you know, a, a unique and remarkable challenges or difficult challenges in remote teaching. And a number of papers have come out in recent months that have addressed these issues. Um, one particularly nice paper came out in Ethology in August of 2020, uh, where Hughes and colleagues gave some nice recommendations on how to teach behavior online. Um, there have been papers on sort of the challenges that teaching in higher education face, as you see by a case study here by Bao in um, March of 2020, right at the time of the pandemic uh, was beginning. Um, and then, of course, then there are, you know, there was a nice paper recently um, on ecology evolution on the impacts on, you know, how instructors and teachers uh, are being impacted in terms of field instruction. And so we have a lot of challenges as instructors, I think, or, or lecturers that we need to overcome. And I think one of the big ones is that teaching online, it's really hard to maintain student interest. Uh, I've struggled with that over the last year or so. Keeping students interested in the topics is hard enough face-to-face. -face. Now I've got them, some of them using their cameras, some not. It's hard to tell, it's hard to keep them engaged. Certainly engaging them in active learning activities like laboratory experiments or activities, uh, field experiences, those are on hold, at least for me right now. Um, and so that's a big challenge as to getting them to learn and, and critical thinking. It certainly is hard to be inclusive in teaching when uh, some students have better access than others. So for example, my institution in Chattanooga, we have one of the best Wi-Fi networks arguably in the country. Uh, but, you know, you step, you know, one kilometer outside of Chattanooga and you're in rural country and you have a lot of students that have poor access to Internet. And you also have a lot of diversity and in, uh, income inequality at UTC, my university. So some students have a, have a hard time getting computers. And all of this can play into affecting the, the mental health of the students, which is uh, um, we know that it's becoming a big issue in terms of students health, um, not having those social interactions and being involved. But as Karsten pointed out, the, um, back when we started the fine, um, despite these challenges and despite the overwhelming suffering and illness and mortality we've seen due to this pandemic, there are opportunities for us as educators. We can use this opportunity, I think many of us have, to engage in new ways or come up with new ways of engaging students. We can expose students to international research. Um, as you'll see the aim of today's talk, I'll be talking about the fine and how it can be used in the classroom. And this is an opportunity to share seminars with students um, from in colleagues around the world. These remote activities that we're engaged in can help us to build a community of connected teacher scholars. Uh, as those of you who've been participating in fine from the beginning, I think one of the wonderful things about it has not just not only been the seminars we've gotten, but also the discussions that have emerged both before the fine, 
after the fine, during the discussion section, discussion period. And then even after that, some people stay around and talk. And we're building the connections that can help us to better educate our students. So we're building teaching and research collaborations that will benefit students going forward. And ultimately, I think if we do this, one of the things that we can do as a group is to promote our own field of study, the study of social evolution. If we're coming out as on top of this as being leaders with innovative ideas, uh, stealing from last week's theme, um, perhaps we can you know, promote our field and, and help grow it in the future. So the opportunities for us to use remote seminars are there, I'm gonna to mention two, I'm sure there are plenty more. And one is to integrate remote seminars into our teaching. We can use this as a way to uh, promote critical thinking in our students uh, through discussion and analysis of the talks. We can help our students with their communication skills, either through writing or oral presentations. And this can also be a way to help our students improve their networking, giving them opportunities for research, for uh, future employment potentially. And I think this is particularly important given the fact that the students of this generation are becoming out of a pandemic and with the unique challenges that the older folks here did not face. And then I think another potential opportunity is we can expand guest speaker options for seminars at institutions we work at. Uh, my institution is a regional institution, meaning that we service the basically the counties around us, maybe primarily a, a you know a 50 square mile area around us is where most of our students come from. So we don't have as much funding as the big institution in Knoxville. And our seminar series is often very local in flavor. But I think if we use, if we can tap into these remote seminars, we can increase the diversity of speakers that come to us, um, in part because it's free. And this can increase access to our students of different researchers and their ideas. And also something that's important, I think, to the fine organizers is to provide opportunities for people from countries that haven't been represented or, or where resources are limited to give them opportunities to present their research and ideas broadly. And so, you know, the, the aim of the fine, you know, when first established by, you know, when Karsten gave this, brought this idea to us, uh, us being myself and Eduardo, um, the aims of the FIME was to permanently establish an international remote seminar that would bring people of all backgrounds together to discuss social evolution. But I think another thing that has emerged from this and this working group that I'm gonna be talking about is working hard to make this happen, is that we can also provide, oops, sorry, provide educators with resources for teaching social evolution. And so the objectives of my talk today are to report to you on a fine working group that has been trying to develop tools for use to use fine tools in teaching and then share ways that people can use these resources developed by the fine working group. And that working group consisted of an amazing group of individuals. Um, uh, including Leticia Alvias, uh, professor at the University of British Columbia, Eduardo Fernandez Duque, who's at Yale University, Marin Hook, who's at the University of Derby in UK, Eileen Lacey at UC Berkeley, Adriana Maldonado Shaparo, who is, I think it's the University of Del Rosario in Colombia, and I apologize if I pronounced or got that one wrong, Adriana. Um, Miles Machinsky is my master's student at UTC. We chose, we asked him to join the group because of his unique training in both biology and STEM education. Neville Pillay, who's at the University of Wits in uh, South Africa. Carson Schroden, who's a, a, a CRNS uh, researcher in Strasbourg, France. And then Nancy Solomon, who's at the University, um, whoa, I almost got that one wrong, Miami University in Ohio. Um, and what's unique about this group is that we, we brought in people, we aimed to bring in people from universities of different uh, sizes. So we had large research institutions, research only institutions, and then my institution is more of a teaching institute. And also we tried to have global representation because we know that different parts of the world may do things differently in terms of how they educate their students. And so this group met regularly, we met weekly or as in subgroups, 
during the weeks between the first and second fine seminar series. And they, the people here are behind the content of this talk today. Um, and we're also preparing a manuscript that we hope to submit for publication to share these ideas more broadly. Uh, Lauren, yes, sir. sorry to interrupt you. Um, me and I think others see me here permanently a kind of scratching noise in the background, which is a bit Ooh. not so pleasant. I do not know what it is, but I thought I'd tell you now before we record this for the entire time. I, I, I don't know whether you see anything that's next to your microphone or so that could be the, the reason for, for that. I don't know what it is. Um, I can try and take a, a perhaps. Yeah, a... I think it's your microphone when you're moving around. Okay, I will try not to move so much. <laughs> I tend to move when I talk. Um, is this better when I speak like this? Carson, is this better? Yes. Yes, it's not always, it's only sometimes. So maybe it okay. was the microphone. I don't see it because your name is in front of it, but maybe okay. that's it. Well, I'll try not to move. I tend, I tend to pace when I talk. And so, okay, so apologies for that. Um, again, if it's a problem, just let me know and I will... Um, I'll try and I'll, I'll refocus on not moving. Uh, so, so when we got together as a, as a working group, uh, we had to first figure out what our, what, what learning outcomes we wanted to think about for our classes. And this, you know, can be a big challenge because of the diversity of the types of courses that are offered. Um, but I think we, we came up with, uh, you know, I think it was, you know, through research on, on other people, how other people do things and thinking, we came up with some learning outcomes that can inform sort of the products that we were developing. And so we put them in the phrase, we, we, we cast them in a, in a form of a question. Uh, what do we want students to be able to do? And so I think uh, we want them to learn critical thinking skills. We learn, want them to learn how to conduct research and also to communicate effectively. We also asked the question, what do we want our students to think or care about? Um, and obviously the, you know, I think the top is thinking about theory. We want them to understand the um, principles that can explain the world around us and particularly in the case of our work in social evolution theory. But we also discussed the idea of, of encouraging students to think about conservation, how our work can improve the uh, conservation efforts for the animals we study, and then also bioethics, making sure that uh, people think about treating their animals with respect, um, both from an ethical point of view and also for the quality of the science. And then the last question we asked is how can we expand our students' professional networks? And this can be done, you know, we thought about, you know, student to student networks um, through student to collaborations, and then of course, student to experience research or faculty networks. And our working group aims evolved into um, trying to show lectures and animal behavior that teaching tools derived from remote seminars are available. So we have developed these teaching tools and we wanna make them available to the general public. Um, and then also we hope that uh, our work can inform organizers of other remote seminars, the teaching tools that can be available for lectures. So that it's that this idea, this work we've been doing isn't just about the fine, it's about a broader, uh, implication of using remote seminars in the classroom. And so we developed what we consider four tools, uh, which I think you'll see are remarkably simple, but act, I think when used in certain combinations can be, or alone can be very effective. And so the first is the uh, one developed by Karsten um, was this idea of a certificate of participation. And this is an important um, product of our group because I think what it does, it can be used to reward students who participate in a remote seminar. Um, in many cases, students uh, need some evidence that they participated in a seminar to get credit for a course they've taken or are taking. And this gives them that information that they can share with their lecturers. And the idea behind this is that, you know, students reach out to Karsten as a coordinator of this fine ask for a certificate of participation, and they're required to do something to earn it other than just attend the seminar. I think initially Carson argued that they could, you know, provide two to three key points about the seminar, 
And interestingly, what he's finding is that the students often go beyond the level of effort that was initially anticipated. They'll write so, uh, up to a page or two of, of information going into depth about the seminar speaker and the work that they're doing. So it's actually showing that the students are engaged deeply in this. And we already have a number of students who are participating in this. Um, as a, in the spring of 2021, there are 26 students from 12 countries that are getting certificates of participation for attending and writing seminars about the fine uh, series. And you can see here the different countries and continents that are being um, represented, 12 countries and three continents. The next uh, product is, a, is another one and is the relevant readings. And so when we ask fine speakers to give seminars, we request that they send us uh, three um, references for three papers that the fine community can read in advance of the seminar. And Eduardo did a really nice job this, this spring putting together um, um, a PDF of all the speakers' readings. And, and in this PDF came, you know, of course, the speaker name, the, the university, their affiliation, the title, a summary, and then three of the readings. Here you're seeing one from uh, Susan Perry's excellent talk last week. Um, and, and so what we, what this it is useful for is the you know, lecturers can now use these readings in the classroom. They can assign them to their students. And for those lecturers, I think particularly for new lecturers, people who are just starting their careers out. It's nice to have papers that are, are recent and relevant to the topics they're trying to get their students to learn about. And so having this resource, you know, when I started teaching back in 2004, I would have loved this resource to have had to save me some time from searching the internet for papers that my students could read. We also know that there are a number of um, uh, reading groups that are journal clubs that have started um, that read the papers together as a lab group and discuss them before seminar. My lab group of um, my students in my lab, there are a couple of three master students and a couple of undergrads, we'll read one paper before the seminar so that we have some idea of what we might be hearing later the next week. And I think it's a, that's a useful activity for those students. The next major product is our teaching slides. And so when we invite people to give the, 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 the fine seminars, we ask them to provide us with three slides after they give their seminar that can be used in teaching. Um, and we're asking people that have given, uh, have already given fine seminars to also provide us with this. And so that we can build a dating base, a database of teaching slides for instructors and lecturers. And the aims of the teaching slide is that we want to make these available broadly. Um, and we ask that the, the individuals provide us with five slides, a title slide, um, two or three results slides that are relevant to the topic or the talk, and then hopefully a, a conclusion or a conceptual slide that someone could insert into a class. And what we're finding is that there are generally three categories we can put them in. We can have a concept slide, a case study, or a study system uh, set of slides. These can be with and without audio. Um, audio um, is nice because the, the people are, the, the lecturers can actually hear the voice of the, the researcher. And I think that if the students engage in that, they can make a connection with that researcher in a way that's different than just seeing a bunch of slides. And we have them submit in the format of PowerPoint so that the lecturers can make changes, um, changes those slides in ways that are best suited for their courses. And Carson has created a, a research gate site where these slides can be found and we have a number of followers already. But as you'll see, we are now putting them on a website that I'm gonna highlight at the end of the talk um, where we can, uh, hopefully it's a, gonna be a place where people can go to, to download these slides and use them in their classes. And I just wanna show a couple of examples of this. Uh, uh, people have submitted these uh, teaching slides to us and so are the advantages of the slides that they've given us. Um, these are um, Peter Kapler's slides. He gave a talk on uh, social systems back in November of 2020. And what I really like about the slides he provided us is that you know, two of them basically focus on terminologies that are used to describe social systems. 
And particularly in this one here at the bottom of the screen, um, we have a, a social terminology for insects. And I personally find that really helpful to have it put in one place because you know, I, I struggle with remembering some of these terms for sociality and insects because I think more about, you know, typically think more about mammals, my study system, and the terms that we use. And Peter's slides ended with a nice um, uh, picture of this, you know, the classic uh, uh, conceptual framework for um, social systems that he has in this nice 2019 paper in behavioral ecology and sociobiology that highlights the key components of the social system, variables and questions, key features, and then specific aspects that individuals can consider and study. And so a slide like this can be, I, I've used a slide like this in most of my lectures um, uh, as an effective way of showing the students the complexity of social systems. Another example comes from Tim Clutton Brock's recent talk in early March. Uh, Tim's slides were, uh, were helpful to me in a different way. Um, here in particular, he had this vital statistic slides where he gives information about the meerkats. And I found this really useful as an instructor that, you know, I know the meerkat story fairly well. Um, I've read many of the papers, but to know the exact details, the, the vital statistics, I would have to go into each paper and dig them out, pull them out for a lecture. And having them put here by the person who does the work was really nice to have. He also had information on the mating systems. And then nice here, you can, you can see that there's uh, images of the different types of cooperative behaviors that meerkats engage in, like babysitting, uh, pup feeding, sentinel duty, and digging. And having those images for the students to see helps them to understand the ways in which uh, different forms of cooperation that we see. And his last slides consist of more, you know, I guess some, some more broader topics, thinking about social dynamics. And then this key hypothesis here, the monogamy hypothesis, which has been used uh, broadly to try and understand um, the evolution of helping. As I said, we are developing a website. Um, I'll take you to that website at the end of the talk. But really briefly, you know, the, the fine teaching slides are going to be available um, at a particular uh, tab of our website where people can come in and download the slides and use them in their classes. And here you're seeing an image of that where you can see that we have, you know, concepts and case studies are showing here. And Carson's already uh, uploaded these so you can see that there are slides available from Peter's talk, Carson's talk from early September. Here's a, some slides from Eduardo's talk in September of 2020 and my talk from early September as well. The fourth product and probably the most obvious and arguably the one that all of these emerge from is the recorded seminar. And so, you know, we have this, you know, YouTube page where, you know, we're streaming live now and at the YouTube page we have, um, opportunities for people to come in and take a look at the different um, old presentations and, and the current ones. Um, and you know, here, you, you click this link here, I won't take you to it, but if you were to click this link on videos, it would take you to all the presentations. And of course, this is the, the starting point for all of this, uh, the, the motivation for um, getting us to think about how to use in teaching. And so an instructor can go in here and pick and choose whatever seminars they may want to use in the classroom. And so I want to just take a little time to recommend some approaches, basically using my own experience and that of a colleague, Nancy Solomons, to give you some ideas on how this potentially could be, how these tools could be used. Um, I'm not saying that it's, these are the only ways, um, but we're just trying to give you a sense of how two of us are doing this um, to give people ideas of how they can integrate uh, fine or other remote seminars into their classes. And so just to remind you then to summarize the four uh, products, we have the certificate of participation, the relevant papers, teaching slides, and the recorded seminars. And so the certificate of precipitation could be used to uh, the so students sign up for it, they participate in the remote seminar, and they receive credit. The relevant papers, they could students could read and discuss these papers. 
And as you'll see, I promote the writing of summaries. Um, this um, is powerful in that it helps students to understand the paper, but it also, if you collect the summaries and grade them, it keeps them accountable so that they'll actually read the paper before class. Uh, teaching slides can be included in lectures, um, but they can also be provided online if students are taking a class asynchrony, for example, and you can always ask them to write a summary. And then the recorded seminars, again, they can write summaries, they can have discussion, and as I'll highlight, they should, you know, if we can invite speakers, this can be a powerful way to engage the students. And I'll, I'll finish the talk with an uh, example of how this can be expanded out into science communication. And so here's a, a general outline of how, you know, I initially envisioned the, this could work for remote seminars. Um, again, this is not the only way, and you'll see that there are variants on this already. Um, I argued that, you know, in this paper we're preparing, I argued that, you know, the first step is you have the students read the paper and a good activity for them is to write a summary, maybe in a journal where they keep a running journal of the different um, papers they've read. And critically, have them ask two to three questions. They then come in, in step two and watch the remote seminar where they take, uh, they could take notes in the journal um, and even come up with more questions. And then I think the next step is really critical is that they discuss the remote seminar. Um, they have questions that have come up from the readings. They have questions that have come up from the, from the watching the seminar. And I think when they have discussions, particularly if you invite the, the remote seminar presenter, they can gain, you know, they get their questions answered and they also can walk away with understanding of hopefully two to three major themes. Once this is done, I think it's critical that they then spend time reflecting on what they've learned. And this can be done in a number of ways. They could write a uh, synopsis of all of the papers or all of the seminars. Um, they could contact the seminar presenter. And critically, I think what is important is that they connect ideas to other remote seminars. And thus far, these are people who have been involved or will be involved or agreed to be involved in my class. Um, I teach a behavioral ecology class um, at UTC this semester, it's fully online. And thus far, I've had Karsten, Leticia, Kay Holocamp came to a class. And just yesterday, uh, Dan Bloomstein came to my class and had a discussion with my students about his fine seminar. In the future, Joan Strassman, Eduardo Fernandez Duque, and uh, Delia Shelton have agreed to come to my class. So my students are going to have the opportunity to engage directly with seven people uh, in the field that are not their professor. And I think that's a really great opportunity for them. Um, in addition, I had them watch my seminar and they, they grilled me with questions for upwards of an hour. And I know that uh, for the four people that have come thus far, my, my students have had questions for them that have lasted 45 minutes to an hour. So they seem to be really um, engaged and enjoying that process. And so I briefly want to show you two examples of how this is, uh, how this could work. Um, it shows you, first of all, that we can do things differently and still meet our learning objectives. Um, and uh, what I'll hopefully show you too is that, you know, I have some data to show you how the students are thinking, what they think about these, uh, the, the way we're doing things here. And so this is Nancy Solomon uh, at Miami University. Uh, she's got an under animal behavior class. Um, it's all entirely undergraduate students, mostly, I think, uh, third and fourth year students. And the way she does it is she reads, she has the students read a paper from the relevant list given by the speaker. Uh, the students then watch the fine seminar. They complete a worksheet where uh, they have questions about the seminar, possibly on how it was given, the theory, et cetera. And then they have a discussion with a graduate student teaching assistant where they, you know, they kind of flush out their ideas, come up with questions. And then after that, they meet with the fine speaker. And I had the opportunity to go join this group uh, several weeks ago, and it was, a, it was a lot of fun. Um, and I know that Nancy's bringing other speakers to do the same. As I said earlier, my class is a little bit different. Um, and I will say mine is an evolving process because I get feedback from the students already on how to improve it. Um, 
I have a behavioral ecology class, which is around 20 undergraduate students, and I have three master students in the class as well. The way I have had them do it is they read the paper, they write summary and questions as I showed in that more generic slide earlier. I then have them watch the fine seminar after which they have a discussion with the fine presenter. Um, I have them watch the fine seminar together in lab. I think it's a, even though they're not physically present, I want it to be sort of a unifying experience to have them or social experience to have them watch the seminar together. After discussion of the finds presenter, they write summaries of the discussion. And as I indicated earlier, they're going to be writing a synopsis of all the finds that they've watched as a form of reflection on the activity. And that will be handed in at the end of the semester. I also collect their summaries twice during the semester. Once recently gave them an, uh, a grade, and then I'll collect them again when I collect the synopses at the end. As I said, I've been, it's been an evolving process and I got some feedback from students where they want, they suggested to me that it'd be better if they discuss the paper before watching the fine seminar. And so when possible, you know, I have to coordinate with the people who are visiting my class. Um, so yesterday, Dan was able to move a meeting an hour. And so what I had the students do is I started the first hour of class, we discussed the paper, we then watched fine, and then the guest speaker joined us for the third hour. And so Nancy and I worked together to conduct a very informal and anonymous survey of our students in our, both of our classes. And one of the questions we asked the students um, was, how do you, what, what, what area do you think the, the, the fine is, is affecting your education the most? And so these are the results from Nancy's class, which she got 27 respondents in my class where I had 20 respondents. And the four categories that they could have chosen in this question was an increased understanding of social evolution, increased understanding of how research is done, and improved written and oral communication skills. And then of course, networking and career advancement. And what you can see, I hope in Nancy's uh, class is that the majority of the students appreciated they were learning how research was done. And uh, the next highest percentage of students was increased writing and oral communication skills. In my class, the students tend to have a more of an appreciation of, of social evolution and how research is being done. So that shows that, you know, different classes are going to get different benefits from this. It all depends on the composition of the class. Um, the, the history of the students understanding their training and of course the instructor's style. Well, as I've alluded to a number of times in this talk, incorporating global speakers can be very powerful. And this is a, a section of the paper by Hughes and colleagues in ethology, where I'm highlighting this, this line here, where I think they argued, and I, I completely agree that it's a particularly, they wanna encourage instructors to invite guests to visit their course. <clears throat> excuse me. And this can be through uh, a synchronous process where all the students are together at the same time, or it can be asynchronous where students can go to a, a website and see the seminars later or watch the discussion later. And they argue that, you know, you should bring scientists of different backgrounds. And what that will do is to enhance the quality of information the students are getting or the diversity of the ideas that they're getting. Excuse me. And so this idea, we've, we've really pushed this in, in the working group to include uh, guest speakers. And I wanna show you some data that I think is really encouraging about the effectiveness of doing this. So we asked the students uh, a question, you know, what part of the learning process do you feel is most engaging? And so we gave the students these options. They could say reading the relevant paper, watching the fine seminar, discussion with the fine presenter, and then it could have been more than one of these three, or they could say none if they didn't like it. And for Nancy's class, what we found was the most common answer was that they appreciated the discussion with the fine presenter. And we looked a little bit more in detail in this and asked them a question about the different components. And I'm only showing the question where we asked them about the fine presenter. We said, on a scale of one to 10, one being poor at 10 being excellent, where do you 
um, where do you rank this discussion with a fine presenter? And so what you're looking at here is data from Nancy's class. And you can see that the majority of the students rank that, that process pretty favorably. These are data from my class. And you can see that basically a very similar uh, pattern emerges. The discussion with the fine presenter was favored by um, over half of the students. And again, I, I apologize. I don't remember how many also put it in here, but at least half of the students thought that um, uh, that there was a good process. And when we when I asked them the same question as did Nancy about with the ranked scoring, you can see that my students really liked interacting with the speaker. We then asked the students a question about the whole process. And so this was, you know, based on that they were reading papers, watching the fine, and engaging in discussion. And we asked if they felt it was improving uh, their education. And we gave them sort of this range of options from strongly agree to uh, strongly disagree. Um, and you can see in Nancy's class, no one suggested strongly disagree, which is good. Um, but you can see Nancy's class, you know, there was the vast majority of the students agreed that, that either strongly or at least somewhat that this was a really great experience for them. And in my class, it was even stronger. You know, I think the, the students in my class are really, really, um, and really enjoyed engaging with the speakers. I'll, I'll show you a couple of quotes in a second. The vast majority really seem to be enjoying this process. Um, I did have one student who seems to hate it, but that, I mean, that's okay. I mean, I'm not expecting every student to love the way that I teach. Um, I think the idea is we're getting numbers here in both classes that indicate that using fine can be a positive experience. And then uh, the last question we asked is, would you recommend incorporating fine seminars into face-to-face -face classes? And I, th I think this is the big picture question because we wanna know, will the fine be effective going forward? And as you see in both classes, the students overwhelmingly said yes. So I think that, yeah, at least based on this small and rep you know, small sample size, at least two classes, we're getting some really nice feedback from the students indicating that you know, what we're onto is something really useful here and hopefully can improve education as we emerge from the pandemic. And I just wanna share a couple of comments, a more qualitative assessment from the students. Um, one of my students, a few students stayed afterwards with me um, and I really appreciate that they're willing to give feedback, both positive and critical. Um, and I think one of the comments that really struck me was that um, for, for some of the talks, if the speakers are from Europe, I may not have them join because it's so late in the day for them. And so I have the students watch the question and discussion session afterwards. And one student commented that watching scientists interact with each other makes the fee students feel comfortable to ask their own questions. And I really thought that was important because that's really what we're trying to do. We're trying to get them to appreciate our curiosity, to become more curious. And if we positively reinforce that and show them that we're excited and that we interact with each other in different ways, that can be really effective in, in, in promoting that. And then I think one student suggested, you know, more critically is like, we like this, but try to tie the activities into more small group discussions. And so one way we can do this is build in ways of using breakout rooms on Zoom, or when we get back to teaching face-to-face, -face, we can have the small group discussions. And one student just told me it was awesome, which I appreciated. Nancy did a, um, a word cloud with her class through the slido.com. And as you can see, there were a number of positive comments that came out from her students, um, in particularly, you know, focusing on research development, research knowledge, communication skills, and learning about scientific language. And so I, I was encouraged by sort of the key phrases that they use. None of them seem to say that, you know, this was really a terrible experience. And, you know, it's important that I think the fine presenters feel like they get something out of it. And so I asked three people what they, what to give me a quote about their experiences. And Leticia wrote that it was a great experience to visit online with a bunch of engaged and curious students whose in-depth questions demonstrated good understanding of the issues. Carson wrote, and I, this is a good quote because, you know, before we met, Carson was the first to come to my class and we talked about, about who was most nervous, Carson, myself, or my students about how it was going to go. 
And it went um, remarkably well with him. And he said, I was surprised how well prepared and motivated the students in both classes were. And Eduardo gave me a quote about his experience with Nancy's class, young scholars asking questions and brainstorming ideas about social evolution, free from the pressure of grades. What a refreshing and motivating experience. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing in education? Brainstorming ideas and not worrying about the grades? I mean, that's a real university for me. And so just a couple of recommendations. Um, I argue that you know what I've shown you is two examples. We promote flexible approaches. You should, if you're going to use these, consider your course aims and learning outcomes. You know, are you teaching a seminar? What do you want the students to learn in a seminar? Are you teaching an upper, upper division or introductory course? You may use one tool in one type of course or multiple tools in another. Are you teaching in graduate courses? And then finally, I think we have to think about national or even regional standards for what we want our students to learn. The FIND has a wonderful opportunity to get students to discuss all, all other topics. Some of the discussions we've had in FIND that can be transferred or translated to classes include the value of natural history data, uh, field methods. Last week's seminar by Susan really was really cool because it showed the challenges that we face in, in doing field research. And I think our students don't get this until they actually do it. So to hear a faculty member talk about that is really could be engaging a student. We can get them to think about statistical approaches. And I think one key theme that has emerged over and over in the fine has been a goal of the fine is to promote the value of long-term studies. How do we build them? How do we maintain them? And what kinds of data can we get from them? And then ultimately, I think students benefit from learning about the decision-making of the investigators. Um, students ask questions, why did you study this organism? How did you get started? Um, we tend to forget, you know, 20 something years on, we tend to forget we were in that place of not knowing and being ignorant. And I think it's our opportunity to share with them personally, if we come to their classes, how we do things and how we got started. And a big picture idea is that this is not just about the fine. It's about using other remote seminars. And here I just have three examples that Carson shared with me of different uh, remote seminars, the Welcome Genome Campus and Conference Project, UCLA, Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology has one, and then Eco, 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 oh, sorry, e Evo Eco Seminars is another opportunity for people to tap into those resources for the classes. And so the last major point before I briefly show the website is that we can also use this as an opportunity to um, enhance science communication so that we take this not only to train students about biology, but also how to communicate the information to the broad public. And this is a project that's been spearheaded by Marin Hook at University of Derby. She's part of the, the working group. And she, the, the University of Derby has a course on science communication and she collaborated with those instructors to give students options to develop fine seminars for the, um, to develop recorded recordings about the fine seminars for the general public that hopefully can be posted on our webpage. And I'm gonna share with you a video that was created by Eleanor Crooks, who's a second year student at the University of Derby and remarkably has been an active participant in, in fine for the last few weeks as she got into this. And so this video will take about four minutes and then I'll wrap up the seminar with uh, sharing our webpage and how you can get some of these resources. So I hope you enjoy this presentation by Eleanor. Hi everyone, my name's Eleanor and I'm a second year student studying zoology at Derby University. I have this massive dream to one day become a primatologist and to help me achieve this dream, I've been getting involved in the fine seminars and the discussions to learn more about social evolution. So one of the amazing talks that I went to the other day was by Susan Perry. Now Susan Perry and her colleagues have done this long-term study and by long-term I mean 31 years on white-faced capunchies in the wild. These are a new world primate that have relatively large brains to their body size. They have really interesting tool use and really bizarre but interesting social rituals that I will talk a bit more about later on. So Susan Perry found that characteristics actually affect the learning strategies of an individual in a white-faced capunchi population. So older individuals are less opportunistic, less 
playful, less active, less curious. And this meant that when they found a learning strategy that they liked, they would stick with it. They would stick with the habit. It doesn't matter if there's better ones out there, they would stick with the habit. Younger individuals that are more curious, more active, more playful, they have a bit more of a problem solving mindset where they will try more things and they're more open to trying more strategies. She also found that there is a lot of observing behavior in the population. So younger individuals will observe older individuals to learn more about the learning strategies. So overall, she found that these learning strategies develop and change through a life cycle for white face Kapunchi. So from being a newborn to being a grandparent, these learning strategies change and that's partially because personality traits change or the opportunity to observe an individual arises, whereas other individuals might not have those opportunities to observe. As the age changes as well, that affects the learning strategy. So now that I've spoken about the learning strategy evidence and data that she found, let's cover innovations because these are really strange. So some innovations relate to foraging. Now these are interesting. So this is where a individual find a new way to process food or process drink. So they might scoot their bum up to a tree and stick the tail in and this will get the tail a little bit wet because it's like a hole in the tree. And then they suck the tail and they found a way to process water. Or it might be investigative innovations or self-soothing innovations. But where it gets strange is the social innovations. This can involve eye poking behaviour where two individuals will poke each other in the eye really deep into the socket. Or it can involve sucking each other's body parts such as sucking each other's ears. Or hand sniffing behaviours. Now these are seemingly weird, strange behaviours, but Susan Perry and her colleagues actually found that they have an adaptive mechanism. So individuals that have an unclear relationship are more likely to perform social innovations. This is, in a way, a risk and discomfort behaviour to test the social bonds between each other. So there's definitely a relationship there but it's a bit iffy, so they perform these social rituals to test the bond, to test the strength of the bond. If this study was short term and wasn't as long as it is, maybe Susan Perry wouldn't have found the adaptive value of these innovations. Or maybe she wouldn't have found how personality affects learning strategies and also affects innovations because those that are more social perform social innovations more. Those that are less social perform investigative or self-soothing innovations more. So it all intertwines and that just shows the value of long-term studies. I'm really interested to see what else Susan Perry does with this research. For instance, if personality affects the social networks of these white-faced communities, and I'm interested to see more contributions that she gives to the social evolution and cultural dynamic and evolution research. All right, so there you saw, you know, Eleanor's uh, presentation that she developed, and what's been really, really been a lot of fun for me to watch is that she's now communicating with Susan Perry and Marin Hook about, and she communicated Carson and Vardo and me about this presentation. So she's getting feedback from the the researchers who who are engaged in this kind of work and and improving on that. So she'll she'll make an even better presentation that we can potentially share broadly. And so I want to end the talk with uh, sharing with you a website um, that we've developed. Uh, uh, it was you know, created by um, Facundo Fernandez Duque, and we're now it's a work in progress. We are we're updating it, so it's not completely ready. But I think there uh, there's a lot of tools there that are useful. And if you you know click on, and I, I hope you can see my website. If you click on the um, the fine website at the you know the top of the the screen, you can see um, that there are different sections here. So we have some information about the actual, um, the fine working group. We have information about our goals, the three of us, the past, present, and future seminar speakers are reported there. And critically, there's also a link that now has teaching tools. Um, as I showed you earlier in the talk, it has information that, um, it has the teaching slides and has links to the other opportunities that we're, we're developing for teaching. And so I hope that this has been uh, a, you know, a, a useful seminar and informative seminar for those you wanna use fine and other remote seminars for teaching. Um, I think for me personally, it's been really great working with that working group and my colleagues on this, seeing the development of 
the website through Facundo's work, seeing the development of the science communication through Eleanor's excellent work. And to me, I think it's been a truly a university experience and I hope that we can continue to do this. And um, now with the time for discussion, we'd love to have some feedback and questions from people. So I thank you for attending. So the way the discussion works is if you have a question or a comment, please put a question mark directed to everyone in the chat. Um, and as I go, I'll, as they come in, I will, will call on you. Um, and then also, if you are in the YouTube uh, group, please put a question in the um, comments and I have students monitoring that situation. So Marin, please go ahead. I was actually going to suggest that we ask also the um, undergraduate students that are present, because I know that there are a couple present, um, what they think and what they would like to see and what, what they feel about these ideas that we have presented. No. Yes, exactly. Thank you, Marin. I agree. So I've got um, Ricky or Ricky Laser. Laser. Yeah, uh, hi. Guys. Let's Oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, that's me. So this was really cool and really interesting. Uh, I'm a grad student at Cornell. And one of the things I'm interested in is teaching one day. So this was uh, really cool to hear about. But I do have a question. So I noticed in the lovely little graphs that you presented a while back, there were the black and white ones where it was like, what did you like the best about this? And it was papers, watching the fine seminar, discussing the seminar, uh, and A through C. And I noticed that none of the students picked their like, uh, it wasn't their favorite thing, but the most engaging part of it to be discussing the papers. And I would love to hear more about that. Like, were those students interested in only in like an addition to something else or do they find papers not engaging? That's a good question. I don't know if I can say, go to the detail um, to answer that. Um, but I think in discussion afterwards, I got the sense that some students, um, it, it, it's a lot of work for them and, and it's, that's the hard part of the process. And I think that they find the, and I don't know, maybe the social engagement of working with the, with the speaker is more powerful to them at this time. Um, but I think reading the papers is really, and I'm trying to tap back into my own memory, is the hardest part. It's the, we don't know the, the language, the, the jargon. We don't, reading figures is challenging. So I wonder if it would be, you know, I asked this question before I sort of changed the style of the way I'm doing it. I wonder if it would change the answer if I asked them now that we discuss the paper first and then get into the seminar, if they, more, they appreciate it more. Yeah, I would love to know that answer. Uh, I can, can I ask you a secondary question? Oh, please go ahead. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. So I, I am one of those people who find talking to the person much more engaging than reading the paper. Uh, and in my classes, I have also found though that at, if we discuss it first, the paper is better. What are the rest of you? Do you, when you see a seminar and you go and you read the paper first and then go to the seminar or read the paper afterwards, do you, what do you find the most interacting or engaging and where do you learn the most from the paper or from the person? So I'll take a stab at it first and then um, maybe some of the other people on the working group can answer too. So you get a multiple answers. That sounds okay. That would be, yeah, that would be um, awesome. Thank you. Um, I find, in, I find that, you know, I, I get a very limited view by reading a paper because if it, particularly if it's a long-term study with lots of moving parts and lots of data, watching the seminar and engaging with the speaker gives me a much better appreciation for the whole story. Um, and I think as one thing you find is that maybe as you get further along and you have a teaching job is that the time to read papers <laughs> diminishes dramatically. Um, and so, you know, I find myself struggling to find the time to read as I should, as much as I should. So I, I really enjoy the seminars because uh, and then engaging in discussion afterwards because it you know has all the components as visual it has verbal and it has um, text that I can see that I can and then get it from the person I think that's really powerful 
Does anyone else on the in the working group want to follow up on that? I'd like Eduardo, please. Yes, I, I'll try to comment on that. But before, after that, I really want to go back to Francine Dolins. I don't know if you're still there, who, who wrote a question oh, earlier, yeah. and I asked her to come back. So I think my answer to that is what I tell not just only the students, but I've told in the past, the committees who evaluate our course proposals. It, it all comes down to what are you reading for? So uh, I think that maybe one way which we can, I can totally see why the undergrads may feel like they are getting the least from the assigned readings. So how come we're assigning three readings on a topic, both to fully established professors with 30 years of experience in the topic and undergrads. I mean, clearly we should not have the same expectations from those, we wouldn't need those 30 years of training if both people could read the paper similarly. So one way which I think we can get the students more interested is in giving them guidelines and, and really different papers. The same way I always tell them, you get the Sunday newspaper and it's this thick, right? It doesn't scare you because you know what you wanna get out of the Sunday newspaper. And you may throw a section away and you may immerse yourself in another one. So if, if we were to, in the case of using fine, I would say, okay, this paper or, or in this lecture, we're focusing on this, so skip the methods because we're not gonna understand them, maybe. Or we don't really wanna know the specifics of how the different spider species, how, how people tell apart the spider species, if not, if I'm not studying spiders. Maybe I, I, so I'll give them guidelines on how to read and where to focus. And what I am hoping, having learning outcomes communicated to them as you give them the paper. That's what we do ourselves. I mean, Laura was saying how there's no time. So how do we handle that? Well, we go to a paper to really understand the specifics of what is the dose of ketamine they use to anesthetize the monkey. And I go to another paper just to see what are the latest reviews on the evolution of spider sociality that I may want to be aware. So we, we, if we keep telling them that, I think we can help them read with a purpose, read with a goal, which is what we normally do when we grab a piece of reading. So that, that would be my suggestion. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I just want to be sure we go to Francine if you're there, well, because I think she has a very challenging question, but one that deserves. Sure, I, will, I want to let Leticia, I want to let Leticia come in and follow up on that. Yeah, just we go there. really quickly. I love Eduardo's suggestion actually. So in my animal behavior class, students read a paper a week or every couple of weeks. And sometimes the papers are challenging, but if I told them, you know, this is what you need to get out of this paper, focus on this, then yeah, I think that's a great idea. So the way that we give them learning outcomes for the units that they're working on, given a learning outcome for this paper. And you, yeah, I think that's great. I love that. I'm gonna use that for my next, next time I teach that class. Thank you guys very much, all of you. Great, well, thank you for the question. Um, so Eduardo, I need to, I, I, it was hard for me to follow the chat when Francine, I was talking. So, so I, I just wanted, I see Francine now, and Francine, okay. yeah, I can read your question or, or it says here, she was saying, uh, to, 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 where are you Francine? Really great ideas and collection of teaching materials. Thank you. One question. In many undergrad universities, there are no teaching assistants. How can this work when the professor has more than 80 students and that's only one of their multiple courses per semester? I do have sometimes teaching assistants and I was feeling the same Francine. So uh, I'd like somebody else to comment on ideas on how can one adjust some of the suggestions for, for this different setup where you may not have teaching assistants. Well, I would, I would chime in that, you know, if you have a lecture based course, you can simply insert some of the teaching slides that are available into your lectures. That'd be one option if you're fully lecture, but if you're trying to engage students in discussion, I admit at large classes, it's really tough without TAs. The, the size of the classes that I work with are generally in the range of 20 to 30. And I might have multiple sections. So I'd be curious to hear from people that typically work with larger classes. Uh, I see Miles has his hand up. Uh, 
Miles, please go ahead. Yeah, so I don't work with, uh, I don't have experience working with larger classes on that scale with like 80 students, but um, I think that one of the suggestions that one of Lauren's students offered as far as working in small groups may lend itself to be helpful here. And so um, instead of needing to monitor 80 different students all speaking as a class discussion, you could distribute them into smaller groups and have those groups kind of summarize their discussion, um, certain points that they may um, and maybe that might be a way for you to be able to evaluate what they are discussing and how it may be benefiting their learning um, without needing to check in with each individual student since there's so many. Um, that's a good idea in person when you can have the groups, but online it's really difficult. So um, trying to organize students into groups, making sure that they attend the groups, making sure that they can all meet at the same time, um, all of those things are huge challenges. So, um, and then students don't show up and then the other students complain and it becomes a nightmare to trying to organize students into groups. I do that already, um, but thank you. That's a really good idea in person and I, and I do organize in groups. Um, it's just, I love the ideas that are being presented. And then I look at them and I think, how can I do this when I'm teaching 120 students in a semester over three courses and it's just not gonna, it doesn't always work. Um, I saw Leticia had your hand up. Can you wanna reply? Yeah, so I can, I can totally see the issue if the class is asynchronous. In my case, I have 66 students and I did a, a poll before the semester started and I was hoping that everybody was gonna be able to attend it synchronously. And fortunately, only two students couldn't and they dropped out. And so, yeah, within a synchronous class, what I've done is actually in Canvas, which is the platform that we use for teaching at UBC, I use the discussion um, set of section there to put the students into these working groups. I put them into breakout rooms and I asked for the group to report on whatever worksheet that they are working on. And then during the class, I read through their answers and I actually use their answers to build on that to continue with the lecture. And it actually works really well. I, it actually works so well that I'm, I'm now thinking that I may ask them to have their laptops in the class because it, it, I can just scroll through their answers and sometimes they have to draw graphs and things. And it's really easy to see what the gr different groups are thinking about. And I, I have been casually, sort of impressed how well it has worked online to do break rooms and group activities actually. I do have a TA that helps a bit, but I think it could be done without, but yeah, 120 is a lot. And if it's not synchronous, I can see that is difficult. We, we have to teach asynchronously at least right now. So yeah. it, it's even more difficult, but yes, I think asynchronously or in person, that's a wonderful idea. Thank you. Thank you for the ideas. So I'm looking at the question marks in the queue here, Eduardo, you were next, did you? Already... No, no, I, my, my, my question mark was just to make okay. sure that we didn't miss Francine. Okay, so then, then we have a question from Zulema, please. Yeah, hi, um, Zulema Tang Martinez from the University of Missouri, St. Louis, and I'm retired, so I no longer do any uh, quote unquote formal teaching, but I'm still highly involved in the department and in several different aspects that um, involve education. And I really like the concept that Lauren put up in the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance is also one of my favorite guides for, or it was when I was teaching. But it occurred to me as I was listening to this that there's another format, which some of you may have, that um, would, would be a good place to use the, the fine seminars. Um, at my university, we have an animal behavior discussion group weekly that has been going on since 1976, which is when I first came to UMSL. And, um, what we normally do is we meet and we uh, discuss a paper. We, everybody reads a paper and, um, and then 
as a group, we discuss it. And what's really neat about this particular group is that it involves at least three different universities. Uh, it involves currently um, people from uh, three to four departments, depending on who attends any given session. And it's undergraduates, graduate students, faculty, retired, postdocs, et cetera. And obviously not all of those groups are always represented. It's also very informal and it's sort of a fun group. So very low pressure and people see it not only as a learning opportunity, but also as a way to see friends, especially during the pandemic and um, you know, keep in touch and so on. Um, but it occurred to me that one possibility for that group, since you're reading papers anyway, is to specifically use uh, the papers that are provided by FINE and perhaps also to have the seminars available so that people in the discussion group can watch the seminar ahead of time if they want to, and then invite the FINE presenter, the seminar presenters to take part, to be present for the discussion and to be involved in the discussion. And, and that's an informal setting but it, I think it reaches across many different levels and I think it might work really well. I haven't tried it, but it certainly it's something that I plan to think about and, uh, and see whether you know, that works. And by the way, a few students do take it for credit. So the university has agreed finally after many years of trying to get this to, um, to have students take it for credit uh, if they want to, but generally it's, you know, most people don't take it for credit. So they just come and we have discussions and the group can vary anywhere from at any given time, uh, any given day that we meet anywhere from six people to 15 people, I think is the max we've ever had. So I just wanted to throw that out as another possibility of the way that the fine series can be used. Yeah, that's a wonderful idea, Zalema. And um, I think the, you know, we'd encourage people that not just in the classroom, you know, thinking about the Zen, you know, reading groups, working groups, you know, to use these opportunities, not just the fine, but also remote seminars in general for these purposes. One thing I forgot to mention in the talk was that, um, you know, we are sort of building a list of presenters who are interested or have the time to join classes and may make that available. We're having some discussions about that as, as a group. Um, yeah, so that could make it, you know, broaden it how we, how we, how the fine speakers get involved in these kinds of discussions. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Did anyone else on the working group? I'm just going to check in once in a while with the working group to see if anyone else wanted to respond to that. I think Miles, that, are you trying sorry, to get in? Yeah, I was trying to wait because I've yeah. already spoken, so <laughs> I wanted to be patient. Um, I think that uh, at least what I kind of have conceptualized for these tools and the materials that we're kind of creating, um, I've always assumed that anything that fine involves could be used at a a higher education, very formal learning environment and also an informal learning environment, and then also could be applied to public education and as well as what um, a new question in the chat says, asking if it can be extended to like secondary education, like high school level. Um, and I would kind of connect what Zulema was saying um, and that thought of it of fine being used at the high school level. I would say that um, if we can benefit students early on in gaining these core um, skills of those three core learning outcomes of being able to understand research methodology, communicate effectively, and also like analyze um, scientific text, I think that would ultimately benefit students in pursuing science-based degrees and then going into um, science-based careers. Um, as someone who teaches at the high school level or has experience doing that, I can let you know that a lot of these kids have very, very poor like science content knowledge 
because they have very poor science research understanding. Um, and so they're disconnected. They understand that there's an importance to learn the material of like life sciences, what biology basic core like um, topics are, but uh, they still feel like being a scientist is outside of their normal realm. Like scientists aren't normal people. And so I think that all of those things will kind of help blend that gap and maybe improve our overall society's understanding of science, which then can maybe impact our government decisions and like benefit us in other ways that we can get off topic on. But I think it's all good, good ideas. So thanks, Miles. Um, I would argue we're not normal. <laughs> Anyone who chases after a rodent for a career, that's special, right? <laughs> um, uh, the next question comes from Ellen. Um, yes, hi. Um, I'm currently an undergraduate student uh, at University of Constance in Germany, and I'm helping um, Dr. Gisela Kopp with the organization um, of an animal sociality seminar. So um, actually last semester we incorporated um, a few talks of the fine series and we really enjoyed it. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to give like a feedback um, because like, the so I had a few questions that you already answered in your talk. So um, we actually organized um, because the, the seminar is fairly small, um, so it's like maximum five people. Um, so we try to have like discussion groups um, pre and post talk. Um, and we try to do it on Zoom um, synchronously. However, there were like a few scheduling conflicts with the participants, uh, which made it a bit difficult. Um, so we had to think of a way to um, engage people um, asynchronously as well. So you actually um, ha like gave a good suggestion about um, having the students who can participate to write a summary and um, pose a few questions. Um, but yeah, I also wanted to ask like, do you have any suggestions for uh, people who missed the post-talk discussion? So overall, um, at the end of the seminar, um, usually the students have to write a report about the talks they've um, seen and yeah, just to give a summary uh, of the speaker and the research and what they took from it. Yeah, I think I'll respond. You know, uh, you were, I think you mentioned about students who missed the discussion after the talk. One option is that this discussion after each fine seminar is recorded. And so we normally, we have research seminars in the fine. This is a unique talk this week, but you know, there'd be this long discussion of 45 minutes to an hour that the students could watch. And while it's not as, in my opinion, it's not as good as being in, interacting with the individual directly, it is an opportunity to see the kinds of questions that researchers ask. And in fact, some of my students commented you know, we had them, I had them watch the, the discussion with Tim Clinton Brock after his talk. And um, that was where the students really mentioned that they felt like they learned how to ask questions. And so that could be a tool if I'm, if I'm understanding your question correctly, that, you know, you could have students get something from it, um, even if they're not able to participate directly in conversation. Thank you. Sure. Um, Eduardo, please. Yes, but only it isn't a question as much as it is a, just a reflection that to, to comments by others. So only if anybody else, I'd rather please ask if somebody who hasn't talked would like to, I can wait. If not, I'll just share my thoughts, but. Okay. Well, why don't you so go ahead. I, I think it has to do with some of the, what I would like to speculate or underline some of the comments. Uh, and this is something that I brought up in the working group. So many of us, I feel, struggle with releasing control over how much the students can learn. 
And it, so little of this is about teaching. It's about learning. And yes, you may think that it is two sides of the coin, but really what matters is the learning, not the teaching. We cannot make people learn. That we, we know that. I mean, if you've raised kids, I mean, you cannot make people learn unless they want to learn. So going back to Francine concerns or 20 of the concerns of how we do this, how we do that. I mean, years go by and more and more, I feel like the combination that these days information is more available than ever before. I keep telling students, please don't memorize what I go checking Wikipedia. It's not worth it. It's, it's really about motivating them. So, so and, and can, can we do that with 150 or 10? Sometimes the tools for motivating them, I don't know how much they need to be adjusted for number of students. Maybe there's hope in saying, okay, if my task is just to getting them, ex getting them excited about the topics, then learning will happen. But learning will happen on their own. If, if, if we don't have teaching assistants to organize breakout groups, have the breakout groups anyway, without us. Yes, there will be students who will say nothing, but that's gonna happen as well if you have teaching assistants. But maybe that student who is saying nothing will learn from the one who is saying. We cannot, and, I, and I'm saying this as I, I mean, I'm struggling with this. I cannot force people to learn. There's, I mean, at one point you realize I tried everything and there's no more that I can try. So, uh, but we can always try to motivate them. Uh, and, and really there's nothing wrong with being explicit about placing the responsibility of learning on them. It's not that they cannot just be passive sponges of what we deliver. It doesn't work like that. And, and of course, at least in, in the US now, it's, it's sometimes complicated. I mean, telling a student, listen, you're gonna learn as much as you wanna learn. I mean, it's up to you. Really, it's up to you. I'll just give you a grade. But even if you don't say it like that, if we can find ways of, of getting them to understand that this is about them, and, 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 and some people will take it. And today we have this amazing example, Eleanor, you're giving me the gold standards of what we would like to see in a young scholar. She took it on her own, on her own and she ran. And some people will run, some people will jog, others will walk and some will do nothing. That's life. <laughs> so uh, I just wanna say that, yeah, I, I, I share on the feelings of, of sometimes feeling like we can, how do we do this? But we need to do it with them. That's maybe the, the bottom line. Don't feel like these cannot be just us. It's with them. Yeah, so. I'm going to segue. You gave a nice segue into Eleanor, who's next in the queue. Yeah, I was just going to give a bit of feedback and go off what Eduardo said, because, I mean, Marin will know our class is a lot of people and we do do breakout rooms for different things. And sometimes you go into a breakout room as a student and there will be people there that just <laughs> won't talk. You know, people aren't really comfortable with talking online and stuff. So I agree, like, it is sort of up to the student how much they how much effort they want to put into learning extra things. But I think personally, I'm very lucky to have someone like Marin as my tutor who is interested in things that I want to be interested in. Not everyone has that. So I think really pushing the network side of it and the fact that you will be able to talk to academics and discussions with academics and then also older students, because obviously I'm only in my second year and there's people here that are master students, PhD students that are doing similar things that I would eventually want to do. So when Marin sort of mentioned the networking side of it, and well, for me, it was like Eduardo and other primatologists would be there. It really made me want to come more than just sort of sitting down and doing an extra lecture a week. Obviously, the, the seminars have been extremely interesting and I have enjoyed them. But if you just said to me, this is an extra hour lecture. I don't know <laughs> on top of all the rest of the work and the essays I'm doing, I would have wanted to do it. So I think really pushing the network side of it would help students get involved. But as Eduardo said, it's kind of up to you how much you do how, as a student, how much you want to get involved. And if you miss out on the opportunities, then I guess that's your own fault sort of thing, <laughs> but yeah. Lauren, I think we missed Ivana Salah Leon. Oops. <laughs> right. I shouldn't have talked. I mean, Ivana, you were waiting. Are you there? 
Silvana, yeah, there you are. Yes, hi. I'm here, but I think Miles already answered my question. So I thought it was like <laughs> done because I was asking about uh, including younger students uh, to, to apply these kind of tools in teaching social evolution and biology. And Miles already said that these tools can be applied to, to any level. So I got fine with that answer, but thank you. I don't okay. know if you want to say something else about that. I mean, I, I think it, it, both Miles and, and, and the comments that follow Eduardo and, and Eleanor is, you know, reaching the students somehow is really important, whatever age they are, getting them excited, getting them to, you know, I look at it this way, if I have a classroom and I'm just going to client define my class as what I teach, you know, it could be a high school room, it could be college, university, I have a class and I have you know, three tiers. I have students that are really excited, want to learn. I have students who are in the middle that might want to learn. And then I have students who don't want to be there. And my job is to try and get one from the don't want to be there into the next category or above and try and get those students, some students from the middle category to the ones that really want to learn. How to do that is really challenging. It's really hard. But um, I think from what I'm hearing from my students and feedback from all of you that some of these you know, these fine tools or how we use them can be really powerful in getting those students to get engaged. Because to me, it's not about that they learn a bunch of facts, it's that they learn to think and they learn how to process and that they get excited about something. Uh, Miles, you got your hand up. Yeah, my Wi-Fi is kind of acting out, so I'm sorry if I cut out as I'm speaking. But to kind of talk on the last little bit of the discussion, thinking about students being engaged and whether or not they're in, interested in learning. Um, I think that I agree with bits of what Eduardo had said about as a student's decision to take responsibility for their own learning and to push themselves in order to grow is something that comes from them. But as instructors, we play the role of making the information accessible and could because we have the we have the specialty right and so we're the we are the experts and so we should be able to make that information accessible to students based on their level and also what lauren had said um about engaging them and so i think that um the fine seminar like offers a lot of opportunity for that and then there's always going to be your I think that it's complicated to get students that are not interested in being in the class and learning the material moving up from those tiers, like Lauren was saying. I think that's difficult because there's so many, uh, it's intersectional of like why they may not be engaged or why they may not wanna learn. It could be that they don't think it's accessible where they don't believe that they may be worthy to learn science information. They may not see anybody in science that looks like them. The, they may have some other complications happening at home where they just are having a really hard semester, whatever it is. And so kind of at least being empathetic of those that whole conglomerate of all these different things that can weigh in and still trying to put in the focus of like at least I can try to engage you and make this obtainable in some way is all that we can really do as instructors and then their progress based on how we kind of hold those the path for them shape it for them um uh, will will also yes be in like based on their own um interest in, in pursuing something and putting in the work. But I think that we have a lot more influence than what was kind of being led to believe at that last little bit there. Um, and I think FINE offers a lot of opportunities for that. Uh, Jordan, do you want to chime in here? Hey, everybody. Uh, Jordan from the University of Zurich. Um, so yeah, just to, to continue on the conversation of like reaching people with diverse interests, one thing I found in, in my limited teaching experience that's very helpful is having open-ended uh, assignments that are directly gauging understanding of the material, but allow a lot of freedom from the student's perspective in terms of what that looks like. So to, to give you a concrete example, I had a colleague who taught a course on evolutionary medicine uh, last semester, and they read um, the paper that I gave my fine seminar talk on uh, last, last fine seminar. And what they had the students do was basically draw out a picture or a diagram of the theory we were testing. And so they kind of gave everyone a basic causal structure of, you know, like boxes with arrows to work with.
but it was really fascinating because, you know, you had students that I think are very maybe technically and scientifically minded who drew these very detailed box and wire diagrams of, you know, harsh environments is, you know, affecting allopurinol care and so on. But you also had students who drew beautiful pictures or even wrote like little kind of poetic quotes about the ideas. And it was very interesting because they, they noted that for some of the papers when they started doing that, students who were not as engaged in the maybe analytical part of the assignment started expressing greater comprehension than they had understood through these other ways of uh, engaging with it. So obviously you can't replace tests with uh, drawing pictures, but it's nice to have additional assignments where students are forced to show some comprehension of the task, but in a very open-ended way. I'll follow that, Jordan, because I've, I've had a similar experience where I offered my students in a physiology class to different ways of uh, turning in a final project. They could do it written or they could do it uh, visual. And one student gave me a poem as part of it. And I thought it was pretty effective. And yet, but it's not the exam, you know, it's a different way of assessing them. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else on the working group want to uh, provide some feedback or their thoughts on this or I don't see any other questions in the queue. So if um, we don't want to, you know, if we can, I can turn off the live stream and we can stay around and have some discussion or if more questions, people have more questions, please feel free to put them in there. I guess I have um, a comment, question, comment. So um, maybe you, Lauren and Miles, some of the others would, would have some feedback for me. In my animal behavior classes, there are a lot of pre-medical, uh, pre-health students, a lot of pre-meds that I, I, they don't really understand evolution. Um, I don't know how interested they are in that underlying framework that we use. And so I'm not sure if these activities, despite the summaries that you should learn, I'm not sure how engaged they get in these activities that we're trying to do with the fine seminars and stuff. And so um, I'm concerned that I'm not getting them engaged in this animal behavior class. I think they're taking it to fulfill what they think is an easy way to get a requirement done, um, but I would like for them to get excited about this stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's a big challenge, Nancy. <laughs> I don't know if I have a good answer to that or. I, I'll, I'll throw an idea and then I need to go so that I'll do it. I'll use it just for saying bye to everyone. And it, because there was a comment there, right? Somebody was miles talking about accessibility and then your question and see, and accessibility is really, it's very much connected to what I was talking about before, learning. Mm -hmm. You're, we're saying, is the material accessible? In a way we're saying, am I reaching this person's mind? And unless I know this person's mind, I cannot reach them. Now, Nancy tells us that these are, these are pre-med students. So Nancy has learned something about this person, these people's mind, right? They, she knows they're pre-med. Something that, that I try to do with large courses, actually with all courses, I definitely always, always ask students, to share with me why they're taking the course. And I welcome, be honest. You may be taking it just because you have this requisite, right? You've been delaying until your senior year, your science credit. So don't tell me that you have, since I was a kid, I want to study owl monkeys. You're doing it because you need to graduate, fine. So, so that's the accessibility. For me to make it accessible, I need to know that this student is there because he or she has no choice. But then that open, now I go to the open-ended, I don't know whose idea was about the open-ended assignments, but I, Jordan, I agree. There's always something, I mean, that's where the creativity of the teaching, I always feel like I could teach anything if you let me talk about soccer or animal behavior. <laughs> because even the pre-med student, I mean, it's about us being creative and getting them to think 
about how some of these animals have really given them the tools to treat people for disease. I mean, right? I mean, we are studying the animals that medicine has used for a hundred years to learn about disease. So uh, I think that letting them know that we understand that you're not here by choice or letting them know that we understand you we should rather be taking another primer course that already it's making yourself accessible is reaching out it is bridging the gap so so if you have a hundred students how many of those do we really want to become behavioral ecologists please let's make sure it's not all hundred so you have five or ten are we only only going to be teaching for five or ten no we need to be teaching for a hundred and that requires that that the open-ended assignments, the accessibility, and letting them know that, that we understand you have different interests. You're a math major, you're a history major. There's always something for you. And I really need to go or I'm not gonna be ready for, for my meeting at one. Thank you all, thank you so much, and I'll see you next week. Hi, Eduardo. Uh, Zulema, you have your hand raised. Yeah, did you call on me, Lauren? Yes, I did. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to get to chat and for some reason it wouldn't pop up. Um, you know, one way, I also, Nancy, when I was teaching in the undergraduate animal behavior course, I would get lots of pre-meds. And one thing I decided to do early on was to have uh, the course, I would say probably the first third of the course covered uh, behavioral endocrinology and neurobiology. And I also tried to make it fun. Like I used to have one exercise in which the students would play the role of neurons um, and you know communicate and show how they were layers of neurons and then the processing and how each layer only got a little bit of information and so on. Um, and, and that was, that was fun for them, but I think that it also tended to engage the more medical um, uh, students. Uh, one thing I found interesting is that the vet students did not seem to have the same problem as the human pre-med students. The vet students, I think very, I think because we were talking about animals, were very, very interested. Um, but the pre-meds, I do think that they were disengaged. And so what I did was to try to make it relevant to them by de devoting a fair amount of time to neuroethology, neurobiology, um, and, and um, neuroendocrinology. Uh, and that seemed to help a whole lot. And I realized that lots of courses on animal behavior and, and textbooks for that matter, tend to um, devote, from my perspective, relatively little time to those topics before they go you know, full blown into behavioral ecology. But I decided to go the other way. And, and part of it, to be honest with you, is also that my training um, was also very heavy in the um, neuro and particularly endocrinology side. I, I always tell people that I, if there were minors in PhDs, my minor would have been endocrinology. And I actually, when I was at Berkeley, repeatedly was invited by the, you know, the endocrinologist who was my mentor and guru and taught me everything I knew about endocrinology. He would often invite me to give the lecture when he had to be out of town. And so I, I have a lot of familiarity with that, even though it's now out of date, but nonetheless, you know, I have enough that I could do that. But that is one way to try to cover topics that are behavioral topics, but nonetheless overlap strongly with the sorts of things that they're interested in. I don't know if that helps. I'm not sure because I almost, do none of that because there are other neuro courses yeah. and you know everybody knows how this is you only have so much time there's no other behavior course um so i spend most of the time 
almost all of the time on behavioral ecology yeah. topics. Yeah. But that's an idea. I'll think about that because there are some good, some interesting concepts, stories and stuff. And I think the students would like that better. Um, I just, I'm never sure how they feel because any feedback I get is always anonymous or yeah. they won't reply. Yeah, but even, even with the, uh, even in behavioral ecology, I mean, if, if you think of some of the neuroethology work, like Ron Hoy's work, which is incredibly neat, you know, or some of the, uh, the studies, the early studies that were done looking at behavior patterns in aplesia, um, which is all neurobiology, you know, where they, um, uh, but it's still what I would consider to be very solidly behavior and in some cases, behavioral ecology. So it might be worth, you know, thinking about and trying it out. Yeah. But trying to make it fun also, I think, makes a big difference. <laughs> like what I felt really foolish the first time that I tried the neuron thing, you know, having the students play different neurons in different levels. Um, and, and I did it with the visual system, but they really got into it. And I think, you know, at the end they said, well, they understood all this much better and that before it was just like, okay, you know, there's this concepts, but when they actually had to do it themselves and found the, themselves communicating, you know, with the neurons that they were synapsing with, that that made a big difference in, in their understanding of how things work. And obviously it wasn't perfect. I mean, you can't have people be neurons, but, but the basic idea, I think, got across to them. Okay, I'll think about that. Marin says, how do you play the neuron, Zulema? <laughs> well, what, what I had, and it's very hard to just explain simply, but you know, I, I talked about the, the, the first level of neurons were the, um, the visual receptors, right? Um, so you had the, the rods and then the rods would get certain information and you get filtering as, as you go along. And so the one, one rod may only respond to one very small aspect of the environment. Another rod responds to something different, but when those two rods, and in a very simplified example, communicate back to the next cell uh, in the visual system, then that second cell then integrates that information and gets a little bit more of the picture and you just keep going back. And so I would start out with something like, you know, um, this is what the person sees, there are two girls, one has a red coat, one has a blue coat, they're walking a dog near a barn on a snowy day. Um, and then, you know, you start out with each neuron getting just a tiny little fraction of the information. And by the time you get to the occipital lobe cells, the whole picture begins to integrate. And so those people know you know, the, the last level, they know what the picture is, but at each level, the neurons only have a portion of that information and only by going all the way back and integrating all these bits of information, do you get the, uh, the whole story. But I mean, obviously <laughs> it's, um, I'm just trying to, to put it in words. Um, I actually may at one point, I, I can't remember for sure, I may have prepared a PowerPoint for the Animal Behavior Society for an education workshop, but I don't know if I still have that or not. But that's the general idea. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, it, it does. <laughs> if, okay. if you have that, it would be fantastic if you could share that actually. But um, I actually also had some, uh, something similar to say to Nancy. So uh, my animal behavior course is called Biological Basis of Animal Behavior. I have, at this year I have 97 students on it. So a huge class as well. And um, so, uh, um, three quarters of the students are studying zoology. 
a quarter is studying uh, biology and uh, traditionally at my institution, the biology students tend to be much more lab focused and microbiology and potentially also human science focused. And so um, knowing that there are some people that actually um, prefer more of this physiological stuff, um, I have, uh, so one of the um, assignments that they have to do is an essay. And so we included much more questions that are focusing on these physiological things, but I do teach also the physiological basis so neurobiology, endocrinology, genetics. Uh, <laughs> and I, I think that I, I always have this problem that the majority of the class, prob including myself, probably don't like these parts. Um, and I, obviously prefer much more the behavioral ecology part, um, but the others prefer that part. And so I try to, I've tried to find essay questions that sort of integrate that. So one of the essay questions is about how to, how the knowledge of the physiology in the broadest sense helps to understand the animal behavior, which then helps to protect the species because the biology students often say they are not interested in conservation and ecology yeah, and, yeah. and so on. And the zoologies people say, I'm not interested in the lab. And so I try to, I've tried to find some topic that integrates these things. So I don't know how effective that is. The topics usually don't get picked up by many students, but the feedback generally is that they are happy that these choices are there. Another topic that does fit in well is the the advantages and disadvantages of twin studies, because most of the examples they will find are obviously human examples, but it is about critique of the approach. So it also would fit for, or would, would be interesting, I guess, to med students. Yeah, I, I think all of those, I, I also would talk about twin studies and, and some of the pitfalls also that you find in, in your typical twin study. But I think all of finding things that, that they would be interested in, I think um, is the key. And, and then using that as an entry point to why we study the rest of behavior. Um, and, and obviously, I mean, I'll try to find my PowerPoint. Um, in all the moves and in retiring, I'm not sure that I still have everything, but I will try to find it. And if I find it, I'll send it to Lauren. But obviously anything you do like that is going to be like ultra simplified, okay? But nonetheless, you know, I think it, it does help to convey, convey the information to, to the students in a way that they're, they're themselves involved in and can help them to visualize at least to some extent, get get some sort of grasp on what you're talking about when you talk about sensory filtration and you talk about, you know, integration of information in the brain and those sorts of things. So I'll try to find it. Um, I'm not terribly optimistic. I'm I'm thinking that as as I looked at my powerpoints, various powerpoints, I don't remember seeing it, but I'll look and see if I if I have it and just have overlooked it. So are there any other questions or comments that people want to address with the working group? So I just want to really briefly say that <clears throat> Zulim, I'm really excited whenever I hear um, instructors uh, facilitate activities like that at a college level, because normally having some sort of activity like um, playing neurons is something you'd usually see at a secondary middle school or high school level. Whereas in university, I'm not sure how it applies in other countries, but at least here in the States, it's very standard where we go and the lecturer comes in and gives a PowerPoint presentation. Everybody sits and just writes the whole time. There may be activities or a lab that may facilitate an activity, but normally, your day-to-day -day looks like just sitting and writing off of a PowerPoint. Um, and it's not talked about as much in higher education, but in secondary education, especially in like education theory, the idea of inquiry-based learning is really big. And inquiry is basically just giving students a question and you can give them um, a 
certain amount of instruction on what they need to be doing, but they work together in student-student discussions, student-student um, play, student-student collaboration, whatever, in order to answer the question. And so it's basically a scientific method just applied with very loose or very strict kind of like structure to it. Um, and there's in education theory and education literature, there's a big backing of seeing that that improves students engagement, students um, uh, achievement of the learning uh, outcomes or learning goals, um, and also improves their retention. And so having some little game like the neuron play, even at a college level is really beneficial. Um, and that's something that I'm, I'm hoping we'll see more of a, a, a push towards and more of an interest in at a college level. We get so serious, right? So we think about like, we don't wanna play these little games because we're, we're higher up and we're, we're college students, we're adults. But I think that breaking it down a little bit and, and making things simplified sometimes really improves um, how tangible the material and the content is. Yeah, another, um, can I talk, Laura? or are we still using the question marks? Go ahead, please. Okay, uh, another um, exercise hands-on that I, that I did that did not have to do with behavior, but I think it's also perhaps illustrative of the types of things that can be done. When I was teaching general biology for majors, when we talked about phylogeny and systematics and how you decide what a species is and the whole debates around con species concepts. Um, I, would, I would prepare different types of pastas and on some of them I would have, you know, put dots, some black dots, some had red dots, some had little stripes on them. And I would, and, and different types, you know, all the way from little bow ties to shells to uh, linguine, whatever. And, and I would put all of those, like a whole handful sort of randomly gathered into plastic baggies. And then I would come into class and this of course was when we were having normal classes and I would divide the class and this was a big class. I think I had around 60 students. So I would divide them into, I think it was like 10 groups and each one would get their bag and I would tell them to decide, um, how many species there were, how many genera, how many families, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then, you know, they got something like 20 minutes to do that. And then the rest of the period, each group would have to have a spokesperson who would come up and explain to the class how they had arrived at the decisions that they arrived. Um, at in, in terms of how they decided, well, all of these individuals are a species or, um, you know, this other individuals over here are a different species, but they're the same genus, those sorts of things. And um, again, it's not behavior, but it worked, I think, really well. If nothing else, they realized because everybody, every single group came up with a different way of looking at you know, of, of processing the the uh, the pasta that they had and came up. Like I remember one, one group once ended up with, I think two species, while most groups would have like 10 species, sir. Um, but, you know, I think that's another example of a hands-on activity that, that engages the students and makes them think, and then they have to explain uh, their reasoning as to why they, they uh, made the decisions they did. I'm Elizabeth, I'm in Lauren's lab at UTC. I really like that idea of letting them do an activity and it not having a specific answer. I think in my experience, I was the only one of my friends who really liked the behavior side of things and they're all very like pre-med and they all thought that there was like one specific answer for everything. So they couldn't get past the point that like something happens and it could, could be because of group size or dominance. So I like the idea of letting them do an activity and then just letting them explain it. Cause that also shows that they understand the methods more than actual, like the perfect answer outcome. And going off of what we said earlier, I had a class that we did discussions every week and we would write papers about it and we would just have to say how it related to us. 
So there were some weeks where I was not at all interested, but at least I could say it informed me more and like made me a better scientist because now I can communicate it with people who I don't typically communicate with. So that's my input. Well, we're running up on the hour here. 